Hello everyone and welcome to the webinar. Um, I'm Sarah Kinghill and I work for the UK Data Service. Our main presenter today is Natalia Stutter who works as a Senior Research Officer at the ONS. Thank you Sarah for the introduction. Um, so this webinar is going to be about the approach we have taken here at the Office for National Statistics or the ONS um, to develop materials. So when I talk about materials I'm, I'm talking about letters, leaflets, emails and other communications um, that we send out for our online and household social surveys. Um, so the focus that I'm going to uh, the focus will be on materials that we've developed for the uh, online labour market survey um, today. Um, so it's important to bear in mind that the findings that I uh, share with you are specific to this context, so specific to the UK and specific to household surveys. However, it's not to say that they won't work or aren't worth experimenting within, within your own context. Um, I've tried to pull out examples that I think are more kind of universally ap applicable, so hopefully there's learning uh, to take away for everybody. Um, so first of all, a brief overview of what I'll cover today. Um, in this session, I want to cover three main areas with you. First of all, the why. So I'll talk a bit about the context and background for this work and explain why it is important. I'll then talk about the how, so I'll cover the approach and some of the tools that we've used to develop um, our respondent materials. Following that, I'll discuss the what, and I'll do this by providing some examples of our work from both the qualitative and quantitative, that, quantitative tests that we've done in the past couple of years. Um, so let's begin. So first of all, why? So for a bit of background and to set the scene, um, the government has a digital by default strategy to move all services online by 2020. So this includes things like paying your tax or getting a new passport and everyday things that we all might have to do. But it also applies to us, the ONS and our surveys. And this strategy is underpinned by the Government Digital Service, or GDS, um, which provide principles and guidelines and best practice for developing online services. Um, and GDS not only considers the online parts, it's recently uh, revised its guidance so that it now applies to the offline parts as well. So GDS looks at the end-to-end -end user journey, so how do we get people online in the first place and what might happen afterwards. Um, coinciding with this strategy at the ONS and as across industry, um, we've seen an appetite for our surveys to be available online. So we know there is a public expectation on us to do this and we're also trying to reduce the burden of our surveys on respondents um, and providing kind of more choice and alternative modes for people to take part is often, you know, the traditional modes aren't always suitable. Um, in addition to this, we've seen a decline in response. We've seen decline in response rates, and need to look at ways that we can address this. So, at the ONS, we're undergoing a transformation program, which includes taking a push-to-web approach to survey development, uh, with face-to-face -face follow-up in the first instance, which is where this work sits. So, other aspects of this uh, transformation work include uh, questionnaire redesign for online um, surveys as well, and this work sits with my colleagues. Um, so, Alex Nolan did a webinar last year about labour market questions, and Emma Dickinson, another colleague, is running a webinar on Monday um, on socio-demographic questions. So, if you're interested um, in hearing more about that side of things, tune in. Um, and links to these are included on the final slide of this presentation as well, which Sarah can share afterwards. Um, so there, in addition to the questionnaire design stuff, we're also looking into admin data across the office um, to help reduce burden on respondents um, in the self-complete mode. Um, so all of this work um, aims to lead the ONS to being able to produce better statistics, which ultimately lead um, to better decisions. Um, in developing a push-to-web approach for our surveys, we face some barriers. Um, so I've, as I've mentioned, our surveys are currently conducted face-to-face. Uh, -face. This is often in people's homes, um, but also uh, on the telephone, as is true for the current LFS. Um, and the addresses are randomly selected, and this means that we don't know who lives in the home. So one of our key barriers in a push-to-web approach is getting people um, to open the envelope and read the letter, as the interviewer won't be there in the first instance to convince people on the doorstep to take part. So the letter and communications that we develop need to fulfill this role as effectively. Um, but even if we manage to get people to open the envelope, um, which has been a part of our engagement strategy, um, they still need to read the letter. And even if they read the letter, um, they still need to be compelled to go online. And even if we do get them online, we need them to go on and complete the study, ideally in full. So our aim is to create a fr frictionless user journey that spans both offline and online experiences um, across all touch points. Um, and our challenge has been about designing out the barriers and exploring different ways to get as many people um, to the next step in the journey and focus on 
and this work, materials work in particular focus on, focuses on the first point in the above uh, diagram. I've uh, mentioned the word user a few times already um, and I just want to clarify that when I talk about a user I'm not talking about the data user as normal when we're talking about statistics, um, I'm actually talking about the res respondent as a user. Um, and recent guidance provided the gov by, by GDS, the Government Digital Service, um, gives quite a nice summary about people or users um, interacting with government services more. Um, and generally pick up on the role of offline communications. So they state that letters are an important part of how government and agencies interact with users. A letter will often be about a thing that a user's never heard of or didn't know that they needed to do. And this is exactly the space room when we're asking to people, people to take part in an online or any kind of voluntary social survey. So this means it's crucial that the letters we send out are clear and understandable, especially if the user has to act on it or it's explaining new concepts. Um, and as I put on the slide, they go on to say clear letters are better for, better for government too. If a user can understand a letter, they're less likely to get in touch and ask questions via another channel and more likely to do the thing that the letter is asking them to do, such as pay or register for something online. Um, and this obviously has a benefit um, to organisations as well by reducing burden uh, on them. So linked to this uh, wider GDS principle is the approach we've taken to this work, which is focused around what we call, or what is called user-centered design. And for us, this is about um, understanding user needs and encouraging response and making the experience better for users. So in our case, the respondent. But how have we done this? So first of all, um, we need to understand the organisational goal and the aim of the survey. So essentially, what are the business requirements and what are we designing for? Um, we need to establish our legal basis and understand, for example, what the GDPR requirements are and establish who our users are. Is it an individual? Is it an entire household? Is it a subset of the population? Who are we trying to um, you know, get to take part in, in a particular survey? Um, we've conducted literature, literature reviews. Um, and we've also looked at what, what other national statistics institutes and other survey organisations are doing, such as um, NatSen and Ipsos Mori and uh, Understanding Society. Um, because this is looking at um, materials and physical kind of objects uh, in particular, we've looked at design community best practice for print materials, we've explored um, accessibility guidelines and also um, drawn on behavioural insights literature as well. I'm not going to go into all of these, but behavioural insights and accessibility is something that I'll touch on next. Um, so as part of our desk review, we have explored um, behavioural insights literature to see how we might be able to nudge people into carrying out the desired behaviour. Uh, we use the EAST framework developed by the Behavioural Insights Team, or BIT. Um, this was the department set up by the UK government, but it's now an independent company. And the framework uh, they use is made up of four core values, make it easy, make it attractive, social and timely. Um, so this might include things like uh, personalising letters, making your messages salient, uh, trying out the messenger effect by sending um, communications from different people. Um, and at the ONS we're very lucky to have uh, some colleagues who are experts uh, in this area to draw upon and have close links with uh, the behavioural science team. So. Um, that's been really beneficial for us, um, but there are lots of interesting uh, experiments that have been carried out that you can find in the literature. Um, there's a lot of work being done by HMRC and DVLA, um, and you can find more on the BIT website, which I've included uh, in the notes on this presentation. Um, accessibility. Um, so this is something that we need to think about um, in order to address you know, the needs of all of our users and should be considered throughout the whole design and testing process. Um, and this is just some things that I've picked up um, you know, throughout the, the process of developing our work. So some key things are to, to consider are to keep it concise. Um, we aim for a reading age of nine years old and I'll talk about that in a bit more detail next. Um, use high contrast colours. Um, don't rely on colours to relay important information, uh, and the same goes for bold. An imagery should be illustrative and not aim to convey meaning um, as a standalone, so it should be secondary to what you're trying to communicate. Um, and test with users uh, with different needs where possible. Um, as I say, I'm not an expert in this field, but these are some of the things that I've picked up along the way from doing this work. Um, 
at the UNS, we're very lucky to have over 600 field staff, including telephone and on-the-ground interviewers, who have a whole lot of knowledge that we can draw on. Um, so they form a really important part of our discovery phase. Um, often in the initial stages of developing a new product or a piece of material, um, we'll, we'll run workshops or focus groups to explore kind of current challenges and understand the techniques and messages that um, our field staff use um, in, in the current mode to and explore how they uh, use those sort of techniques to overcome those barriers. Um, so if you work in an organization with this kind of setup, then field staff are a really good starting point for this kind of work. Um, and we do this as part of our questionnaire redesign process as well. So moving on to talk about the kind of design process uh, itself. Um, first of all, to ensure that we are um, researching and developing in a user-centered way, we follow the 10 principles set out by the Government Digital Service. Um, and although the word digital is in there, as I've already mentioned, uh, the guidelines have recently expanded to include offline products as well as online, uh, covering the end-to-end -end user journey of a, of a respondent, uh, of, a, of a user. So um, whether it's filling out a tax or applying for a new driver's license, um, it still often involves some kind of paper communications too. Um, and for our surveys, that involves sending people a link, you know, to get online and, and log into the survey to do it. And some of the key principles that apply to the materials are starting with user needs, iterate and then iterate again, be consistent and not uniform and making things open, and part of this is sharing our learnings with the wider community, such as uh, the webinar we're doing today. And hopefully some of this uh, will come, become a bit clearer once we move on to talk through some of the examples um, later in this, in this presentation. So when we started uh, this work, we obviously had some existing business as usual letters. Um, however, we took a blank page approach and started from scratch. Um, we went to our legal department and asked them what do we legally need to say to people we invite to our studies. And then we went out and asked users, so potential respondents, what they would need to know when invited to take part in an online survey. And this helped us build, a con build up content for our materials. Um, that we know users need to know about rather than what we think they need to know about or what want to know about, which is the approach we've taken uh, in the past. Um, and I'm going to talk briefly now about some of the methods we use to test our materials. Hopefully most of you will be familiar with these research methods and, are, and there are plenty of resources available to read more about them if you don't. But um, to start with pop-up testing, um, is a uh, method that we use early on in research and it's where you conduct a short interview or conversation with people often in public or semi-public spaces. Um, it's best used as a tool in the early stages of the, of the development process um, to gain quick insights, test a high volume of ideas and to help develop the next iteration um, of your product which might involve more in-depth or more expensive research like focus groups or interviews. Um, and essentially it involves you approaching members of the public and asking for their feedback. And it's important the research questions are clear and focused, not too time consuming. Um, in the past, we've used a box of sweets to attract people over by way of incentive, um, which always seems to work. So um, pop-up testing is a cost-effective way of helping you get some quick and useful feedback and help identify users' needs and you know, develop your products forward. Um, there is actual guidance from GDS on how to run and conduct pop-up testing and things you need to consider. So I've included the um, the link in the in the notes as well. So if you're interested in finding out more about that, you can go there. Um, focus groups. Um, so these are a traditional qualitative research method that most people um, may have heard about. Uh, we often do quite big groups to get a variety of people involved, but we'll often do exercises so participants um, end up discussing things in smaller groups and feeding back and we found this to be um, a really good way of, of testing out our materials and um, getting lots of feedback uh, from different types of people so um, definitely one to consider. We also do um, interviewing and um, the type of interviewing we do is cognitive, um, and cognitive interviews are traditionally used for questionnaire design, but we've also applied this technique to the materials development as well. Um, we often do this type of research in people's homes where it's a bit more realistic and a bit more um, comfortable for the participants. 
And so we observe them and ask them to think aloud when they're reading something or answering a question, and then follow up and probe on things that they said or did, um, sort of retrospectively. So we might ask them questions like, how, un how clear or unclear did you find that sentence, or how easy or difficult was the information to understand, and follow up with some more in-depth probes, depending on their responses. Again, there's lots of literature and training courses available if you want to learn more about this technique. Um, and the webinar my, that I mentioned by my colleagues um, discuss this in a bit more detail. We um, then uh, qualitatively analyze our data. Um, we conduct thematic analysis. So we'll transcribe and then create sort of memos as we go along, um, group the themes, and then make recommendations for uh, changes and redesign if necessary, to take out for retesting. Um, I'm going to talk now about some of the tools that we use to help us develop our products. Um, so first of all, as I said, when, I, when we talk about users, we're talking about our respondents, who are more often than not the general public. So these are a widely accessible group of people who we can use to make sure our designs, whether it's a questionnaire or whether it's letters, um, we send work for them. So where possible in our research, we try to establish what kind of vocabulary or words people use to describe whatever it is we are trying to convey. Um, so tr by trying to write in a way that uses familiar language, um, it helps re reduce burden and cognitive load. Um, once we've tested an established word and it seems to work and make sense, we do try to recycle this as much as we can across different mediums. So whether it's in the letters, the leaflets, the questionnaire or the website, um, it's, it's kind of creating that common tone and common um, language that we aim for. Um, and some of the tools we use to assist with this include the HemingwayApp.com, um, and this is a readability calculator, and you can use it to sense check uh, where your sentences might be a bit tricky to read um, and help you identify where to make improvements. Uh, it's certainly not perfect. Our materials um, are here are proofread by our comms team as well because we're lucky, lucky enough to have one. Um, and I'd recommend working with a colleague or peer or perhaps someone not as close to the work as you are to help the spot mistakes. Um, Microsoft Word has a built-in tool to calculate the flesh Kincaid grade. Um, and we aim to write for the age of a nine-year-old, as I said before. And this is because by the age of nine, most people have built a vocabulary of 5,000 words. Um, and they stop reading the words and start recognizing the shape instead. Um, and this allows people to read much faster. Um, and I've linked to a, a good blog here on the slide, um, which has uh, more details about how people read and why things uh, should be laid out in certain ways and things like that. Um, and to help with understanding um, the kind of accessibility of your product, uh, Vision Sim goggles or Vision Sim apps offer um, a way of illustrating what it might like, what it might be like as a person with a visual impairment to see the product you're developing. Um, and this is for offline and online products. So obviously this is no substitute for testing with real users, but it can help in the prototyping and design stage and highlight any major issues early on. So if you have access to something like that, that's a really useful tool. And seeing AI is um, another um, application that I've come across recently. Um, it's now available in the UK and it basically converts uh, physical documents um, into audio so that it can be read aloud. So you can take a picture of a letter and it, it it converts it into a, a PDF type document. Um, I won't demonstrate this now, but if you search for it on Google or YouTube, Microsoft has uh, made a video um, and it demonstrates all of the app's features. It's currently only, av only available on iPhone, I think, but hopefully we'll see it on Android uh, soon as well. Um, and we've used this to see how letters perform and it help, is helpful in identifying places where we might want to move things like the instructions around or relabel them. Um, so for example, um, we have a kind of step one, step two, step three in our letters, and um, if that's not in the correct order, the audio will read that kind of in a bit of a jumbled, unlogical order. So they're really um, helpful in identify, identifying where you can make those quick improvements. 
Uh, Google Trends is, is another tool we've used in the past. Um, it allows you to compare the popularity of search terms based on countries and time periods. Um, so when deciding what to call an incentive for one of our experiments, uh, we compared different terminology to see if we could find out the best language to use. Um, the incent incentive was personally what I would call a tote bag or a reusable shopping bag. Um, and but other people had different ideas um, and we compared the popularity of tote bag, canvas bag, reusable shopping bag and just shopping bag um, into Google Trends and based on this we found that tote bag was the most common term. However, when we took this out to focus groups, the term was not understood by everyone um, and because of this, the members of the group were asked what they would refer to the tote bag as and we since changed the word into reusable bag so it's clear what we're referring to. Um, there could be a number of reasons why the word tote bag came out as more common, but it was poorly understood by a particular demographic. Um, firstly, we know at the ONS, um, because we have data, um, that younger people in Britain are higher internet users than older people, and so we expect Google Trends would be biased towards them. Uh, also, it's important to think about why Google, what Google is used for. So sometimes it's for shopping, sometimes it's for research, and in both of those cases, it would be more logical to search for a tote bag um, than other terms. So people might be looking to buy a tote bag, for example, um, rather than a shopping bag. Um, Google Trends clearly has some limitations and things you and you know there's lots of things you could, should think about before relying on it as a you know as a sole kind of tool. However, it can offer a starting point with some evidence behind it rather than simply plucking something out of thin air. However, it's important to validate with other methods uh, like we did in our focus group. So just to recap our kind of uh, approach and research approach, um, so we use social and user research on our materials and engagement strategy to make sure that firstly they're understood, um, secondly that they enable the user or the respondent to conduct the activity they're being asked to do, and thirdly that they feel motivated to take action. Our initiative of approach to putting users at the heart of the journey ensures that we're developing products that meet the needs of the business as well as the users and we're not leaving their needs sort of behind or having to go back and revisit them. So getting this right not only takes uh, time, it also takes failures and for us trying things out that don't work and start the gain is still learning um, and we've taken an iterative approach to this work which is illustrated by the, um, the circular part of the diagram on the screen. Um, and the final stage for us in my team is to produce uh, materials to be quantitatively tested. Um, and this often involves some kind of experiment where we can test different conditions. And I'll provide a few examples of those uh, later in this presentation. Um, but most importantly, our research is about finding out what works, not what's popular, and remembering that we are not our users, um, which is why it's really important to get on test with people who are. So I'm going to talk and show you a few uh, qualitative examples of things we've tested um, and I found which I found might have some wider benefit. Um, so one of the severest things we um, explored in our quali quali qualitative testing um, was tone. Um, so we took out three different versions of a letter, one which was really friendly, one which was more authoritative and one that was somewhere in between. And for us, we found that users expected us to be somewhere in the middle, uh, not too overly friendly and pally, um, which a lot of, uh, you find a lot of sort of modern companies can get away with these days. Um, but, you know, people said, no, that's, that's not what we expect from, a, you know, um, an official organization. Um, but they also didn't expect us to be using the Queen's English and be super authoritative. Um, so that was really helpful. And, um, in these letters as well, you might be able to tell um, by looking at them. We also explored some behavioral insights ideas qualitatively and got feedback on different components, such as the um, on the letter on the left, we've got a sort of commitment device that people can cut out and put on their fridge as a reminder. In, this, in the middle letter, we use icons and we put headlines in all of the letters. Um, and then on the right hand side, we use a picture of our director general at the time. Um, and generally people told us they wouldn't use the commitment device. Um, icons went down really well and you'll see shortly um, how this is something we took forward and the picture of the Director General 
um, which is kind of that messenger effect that I talked about earlier, um, was quite emotive for people. And there are comments that it looked um, a little bit like a, a letter, letter from a politician, which is obviously something we want to avoid. Um, we also looked at infographics and how we convey complicated processes in a digestible and easy to understand way. So uh, in an existing leaflet we tested, uh, we had version one. Um, and we knew version one didn't fulfill its purpose in explaining the process very clearly. So we used our insight from testing to design a new one. Uh, version two was a mock-up created in paint um, to try and show the design team what we wanted. Um, and once we sent that to them, they returned with version three. Um, so we took this out for testing and subsequently made some changes. Um, step one uh, obviously shows a nuclear family there, so we changed this um, to a more inclusive tick because obviously people not in that type of household, it didn't, you know, it didn't speak to them, they didn't relate, relate to them. Uh, in step two, um, it shows a singular computer screen. People thought that they could only take part on a desktop. Um, and at the ONS, we've worked really hard to make the survey accessible on all devices, designing for mobile first. So um, we added the extra uh, tablet and phone there to make it really clear that people could do it on different devices. Um, step three was a little bit too abstract. So we added people um, to the dots to show the data going from people to ONS. Um, step four. Um, People thought it looked quite good, but unfortunately not all of the public knew what a bar chart was. Um, so we replaced this by numbers, which was easier to understand. Um, and then in step five, um, we had one call out uh, over England, um, but we found that there were some, we test all over the UK. So we found that there were some tensions that um, the south of England gets, you know, an undue amount of attention. So we wanted there to be more targets, reflection decisions being made all over the country, thanks to them um, taking part in the survey. And we've had a really um, positive reception to this infographic. Um, and the image here shows how this diagram has been applied in practice on our A5 double-sided leaflet. Um, we've had various iterations. Um, we recently changed the colors to make it clearer and more accessible. Um, and throughout the testing, um, it's something we consistently get positive feedback on, even when we don't probe or ask about it. Um, the padlock um, on the right-hand side on the back of the leaflet, so the left is the front and the right is the back, um, is another interesting thing we found in our testing. By including the padlock, people felt really reassured. Um, our confidentiality statement is something that we were told that we couldn't change. So a bit like terms and conditions, people said that they would be unlikely to read it or just skim read it. Um, and by adding a padlock and highlighting the statement in a box and not making it super small, um, people said that they felt um, reassured and didn't think that we were trying to hide anything. Um, you can also see on this leaflet where we've used sort of a nudge theory. Um, so in the box on the left, um, at the bottom it says to take part, all you need to do is complete step two. And then we've highlighted uh, a box around step two to join that those two things up. And this is an example of endowed progress, making the whole, you know, making the process look easy for the respondent because all they do is, all they need to do is one thing out of, out of those five. And they've already done step one. So our envelope research also uh, offers another example of reiteration. So initially, um, we took envelopes out to an expert panel um, and then on to some pop-up testing to get some quick feedback on lots of ideas. So this is a, where, uh, an example of where we've applied um, that method. Um, the envelopes were then refined and tested in further focus groups and the final designs created for the quantitative test. Uh, we've used BI, B, um, behavioral insights nudges on these letters, um, and this was um, some learning we took from the um, Australian Statistics Office who were doing some experiments um, on messaging uh, across their different materials at the time, and we wanted to explore this in our, in our context. Um, our surveys are a little bit different in that they're voluntary in Australia, they're often uh, mandatory. So um, without doing this testing, uh, we might have, en have ended up choosing what we like best or what we thought would best be received by the public. 
um, rather than choosing something people actually felt that they would respond to. So by listening carefully and considering how people felt when they saw the different envelopes, we were able to avoid taking something forward that could, could have potentially provoked negative feelings, um, and this could have been detrimental to our survey response. So just to illustrate that, um, for example, in England, um, the branding we tried um, we really struggled to find something that was received positively, so we tried things like an English road and a lion, but most had negative connotations. So in the end, we went with something that was much plainer and just had a simple call to action on them. So these are the tests that we used in the Labour Market Survey Test 1. They were sent out in white and brown, and I'll touch on that a little bit in a moment. And we use nudge statements, as I said, such as Scotland, make sure you're accounted, Wales, make sure you're accounted, and play your part in shaping the UK for the England envelopes. Um, I wanted to talk about something that is um, a bit more recent. Um, so in recent months, we've been developing products for an online-only attrition test and to explore whether sending communication in between waves of a survey can help retain respondents. Um, and we're exploring the difference between three groups, a no communications group, an email, and a postcard. And we've done quite a bit of qualitative work to develop these products. So the first step was um, looking at what types of communications would be expected by respondents. And we included some questions in the LFS dress rehearsal in 2017, and also did some telephone interviews with previous respondents. And in this research, we found that people wanted to find out about how their data is used in the study results. And we also found that they'd like to be thanked. So working with these ideas, then, we did a series of focus groups exploring different ideas around data presentation. And once we had refined that, we did some further one-to-one -one interviews. So we ran a number of focus groups, um, the aims of which were to find out what types of information respondents would engage with and establish the best forms of presenting data. Um, so here are some pictures from a focus group we did where we asked participants to sort on an axis um, from clear to unclear and engaging to unengaging on the other. Um, and through doing this sorting exercise, it really helped us narrow down the options for taking forward into future development and testing, because ideally we wanted to, you know, um, aim for those ones in the top right-hand corner, which were both engaging and clear. Um, so from this uh, research, we identified a number of user needs. Uh, first of all, um, the feedback or the you know the presentation the results needs to be more engaging um, so bar charts in particular were said to be very unengaging and users commented on the use of space so too much white space made it look like we hadn't put much thought into it or made much, much effort um, the facts needed to be consistent in terms of themes and topic and not jump around too much and it, they helped us identify kind of problematic terminology that they didn't understand the reference points we needed um, we used needed to be relevant to users. So, for example, one of the facts we tested um, was, did you know the number of people in employment in, in the UK is higher than the total population of Australia? And we did this to try and make the facts a bit more tangible and a bit more informal. However, it only really worked for those who had, had been to Australia and could comprehend the, the size. Um, and we tried a few different versions of that on varying scales. And unless that person was familiar with the with the reference point, um, they didn't really work. And that's difficult to find something that works for everybody. Um, and really, people wanted plain and simple facts, not dressed up and just clear and accessible. Um, they did say comparisons also help make the data more meaningful. So these are, these are some things that we took forward. Um, with the... Um, like different experimental conditions that we were creating this, these materials for. Um, there were some things we had to think about. Um, creating between wave engagement for a quarterly household survey. Um, so first of all, the timeliness of data release meant that we couldn't reference the actual quarter that, that the respondents took part in, um, as this data wouldn't be released in time for printing. Um, for the experiment, we needed to keep the content and message the same across the email and postcard um, in order to measure the effects. So we had to really design for postcard first as well because this, the amount of space that was available. Um, we also had to consider accessibility online for the email because this affected how we could lay out the information. So we had to design for both formats. Um, another interesting thing that we found was that people felt citations were important. 
as it helped them validate the information. However, too many um, uh, asterisks led them to believe there would be too many caveats. Um, so we've tried to stick to one data set and one citation, and this also helps us with space as well. Um, so this is what we've ended up with. Um, this has just gone out into the field now, so we don't have any results yet. Um, but we've tried to create a consistent unit user journey across waves. So the incentive that respondents would have received um, had something similar in design and feel um, on it. So um, we're hoping that that kind of allows the respondent to, to join everything up into one. Um, and then this is just a quick screenshot of the email um, to show how we've had to change the layout compared to the postcard. Um, very aware of time. Um, so as part of our discovery work for the Between Wave Engagement, um, we came across the opportunity to conduct a, a mini A-B test on the subject lines um, using um, using the office's email platform. So these are the two subject lines that we trialed. Uh, we sent, to a sam went sent out to a sample of 400 people who had recently completed the online uh, labor market survey as part of another test. Um, and the email, email platform randomly sent either a, email A or email B to each respondent. Um, so drawing on the feedback from the qualitative testing, we tried uh, subject line A um, and then in discussions with the Behavioural Insights team at ONS, uh, we decided to trial something different, um, so something much shorter, so that when it appears in an inbox on a phone, um, it's uh, you can read the whole amount, whereas subject line A, you can't quite see all of it. Um, but also, we tried to come up with something that was quite intriguing. Um, and then, uh, we had some results, um, so this is quite interesting. The sample was obviously quite small, so it isn't the most robust A-B test we could do. However, we learned some really valuable feedback. So as you can see, out of the two uh, emails, um, B, you've been counted, had the most opens, so we're going to use this in our large-scale um, attrition test. Um, but we're also able to get some other metrics as well from doing this test, and we found 97% of email addresses given were valid, um, and we only had 2.3% of emails bounced back. Um, the highest number of opens for email B was uh, 13, and for email A it was 8. Um, and those who responded online were more likely to open the email than those who responded face-to-face, -face, which is perhaps what we might expect. We had no unsubscribes and no phone calls made to our survey inquiry line with questions asking why they were sent it or you know, complaints about receiving it. So that was really positive for us as well. And we hope this is replicated uh, in the large scale test. Um, so I'm going to talk briefly about some of the large scale tests we've done in the past um, in relation to the materials to illustrate what all this work feeds into. And the test started back in 2017, so some of you might already be familiar with, me, with the results, but um, bear with me so I can explain for those of you who aren't. Um, so in 2017, uh, we did an uptake test to explore how many people we could actually get online. Um, and we trialed different mailing strategies as part of this. So um, first of all, we sent out an invite and reminder for group one. Uh, group two got a pre-note invite reminder, and group three invite and two reminders. You can see that the third option produced a higher uptake rate. However, we actually found the second option to increase uh, timeliness of response. Um, so being a given a heads up primes people for the survey, and we've taken this option forward uh, in particular for the labour market survey because the timeliness of data collection is really important um, as a quarterly survey. Um, also, something to note is that in the qualitative testing, we continuously get people tell us that they don't want to pre-note. They say that they just want to get on and do the study and not be told about it. Um, but obviously, as our results demonstrate here, it's proved to be a really effective strategy um, of priming people um, and highlights the importance of doing that quantitative testing if you have the opportunity, um, because then you're able to sort of measure people's actual behaviors versus what they kind of say they, they do or they, they want. Um, so that's been um, uh, really good, and we've taken um, that those findings forward. Um, so this is just a overview of the package of materials that we sent. So this is the pre-note on the left with the leaflet. The middle letter is the invitation with the incentive slip, and 
the incentive, which has been the tote bag, and then the reminder letter on the right. And so this is a matching suite to promote kind of confidence and legitimacy in the brand and consistency with on and offline. So we're trying to create a similar look and feel across the different touch points. And as I mentioned earlier, recycle that language as well where possible. Um, so as part of this uptake test as well, we also trialed the different colour envelopes and different brands and on envelopes, which I talked about the quality research we did uh, for that earlier. Um, and we found the brown outperformed the white envelopes, and we found a statistically significant result for envelopes of Welsh branding on in Wales uh, versus the plain branding. Um, we didn't see this replicated in Scotland. However, um, it was around the time of the referendum that we conducted the experiment, so that may or may not have had an effect. Um, but something to consider. Uh, we also looked at mail-in on different days of the week, so we trialled a Wednesday uh, second class, meaning that letter la the letter lands on a Friday or Saturday, and we trialled a Friday where the letter would land on a Monday or Tuesday. And we saw spikes in completion on landing days, particularly over the weekend, and we assume that this is because people are having more time available to complete the study, as opposed to a, perhaps a weeknight or when they're in work. Um, then later in 2017, we conducted another test which was focused on incentives. Again, there's a, a link to uh, a report on the slide. Um, and we used the mailing strategy that we identified um, to be most effective um, in the previous test. Um, and we found um, in this experiment that the uh, 15 pound, well, the total 15 pound incentive value increased the highest response rate. Um, the unconditional five pound uh, was also high, but the tote bag actually was the most cost effective um, compared to sending an unconditional five pound. And obviously, 15 pound is a, you know, it's a very high incentive when it's a large scale survey. So that's something we've uh, taken forward as well. Um, so this is the um, example of an experimental test we're currently running involving materials, and this is where the email and the postcards um, that I spoke about earlier fit in. So the primary aim was to explore the effectiveness of sending engagement to survey respondents in between the waves of the LMS. This is just a three-wave experiment, but in reality, the current LFS is five waves. Um, there's not much literature on between-wave engagement, um, and so um, we hope that this is going to be a really valuable study in, under, in understanding um, the effects of that. Um, we're also looking in this experiment at whether or not a pre-notification letter is needed at waves two and three or how effective it is. Um, as I mentioned earlier, we found this to be effective in uh, increasing timeliness of response, um, which is important. But if people have already taken part, um, it might not be necessary. Um, so the other qualitative work that we've got in process, I'll just run through this really quickly because I'm very aware that we're running out of time and it'd be good to answer some of your questions. So interviewer calling cards. Um, as I say, we're building a push to web approach for our online labour market with face-to-face -face follow up um, for those who did who did not or could not complete online. So to ensure the user has a consistent experience throughout the survey journey, we're developing interview recording cards that match the tone and style of our invitation materials. Um, these were trialled in the LMS test three, which was a um, wasn't a, it wasn't a um, experimental test to do with conditions. It was just an opportunity for us to to um, create something that was uh, used by Ipsos Mori interviewers. So the next stage of this is to test uh, with the public and test out with our um, own field force and make them fit for purpose. Um, for another smaller operational test, again, we did something creative and we developed this calling card as a one-off using learning from the 2017 census test where they carried out a behavioral insights experiment. Um, as I say, this wasn't used as part of a quantitative experiment. It was more playing with ideas as we had an opportunity to, de to develop what we've called um, a nudge to web card. Um, and this is where the interviewer just posted this through the door. There wasn't a face-to-face -face follow up. Um, so it, it kind of uses different behavioral insights such as scarcity, a commitment device, um, salience, and then that endowed progress again. Uh, as I say, another part of the communications includes the ONS social survey website pages, um, and we're in the process of testing and updating these pages using uh, some of the um, 
some of the research findings from testing materials and trying to recycle that language across uh, all mediums. So, for example, we've changed uh, the tile from information about our household surveys to our studies what you need to know, which reflects the title of the leaflet that we send out. So, okay, just to recap then, um, some top tips for developing materials. Um, so, first of all, identify who your users are. Um, establish what their needs are and what they need to know. Um, design, prototype, mock up different ideas and get out and research them, get that feedback. Um, reiterate and don't be afraid to drop things that don't work. Uh, recycle content where possible. Um, it not only helps you but also helps uh, the user become more familiar with um, kind of your tone, your brands and your style across the different platforms. Um, draw on expertise, expertise from uh, people outside your own field, for example, um, you know, I've worked with the user researchers, designers, communications experts, accessibility experts and behavioural insight specialists to, you know, lean on them and use kind of what they know about to inform um, how we've designed this, these materials. Um, and most importantly, don't leave it to last minute. Um, research take time, but so does professional design, so does printing, so does dispatch. So um, it's really something that should be considered um, up front and is obviously a, a really important to getting people online in the first place. So I've included some uh, useful sources and references, links to the various blogs I've mentioned. Um, and also just to say, as I've mentioned as well, Emma Dickinson's presentation has taken place on, webinar's taking place on Monday, and that focuses on the um, socio, redesigning the socio-demographic questions for household surveys.